Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, the ARCUS, where Arctic research is connected since 1988. My name is Bob Rich. I'm the Executive Director. And thank you so much for coming to our 18th Arctic Research Seminar Series presentation in Washington, D.C., where today we're delighted to welcome our first duo, Courtney Carruthers and Laura Zanotti. ARCUS works to connect Arctic research across boundaries through communication, coordination, and collaboration, providing the essential intangible infrastructure required for research to advance. We're a nonprofit consortium of organizations and individuals working together in support of inquiry, discovery, and understanding of this important region and informing sound decision making. This seminar series is designed to provide unique access to some of the leading Arctic researchers and leaders for federal officials, members of the DC policy community, and for the broader public interested in the changing Arctic. The ideas shared here represent the cutting edge of what we're exploring and learning up north, and also what it means for the U.S. and the rest of the world. Arcus is excited to be bringing in speakers from the widest range of fields of Arctic-related research to this series, and I'm delighted to announce that in 2018, we're going to be launching a special program to sponsor the travel of Arctic indigenous researchers, uh, scholars, to come to Washington, D.C. to speak in such a seminar and to meet with key stakeholders here. Please watch Arctic Info on our website for details to be released soon. For those of you in the room here, I encourage you to take a look at the Arcus materials on the uh, table outside. And if you are online, the materials will be available for you to take a look at after the uh, webinar has concluded. If you're in the room, you should have received a seminar evaluation, which we'd like you to return to the registration desk at the end of the seminar. It's very important so that we can uh, continue to plan excellent seminars that serve the needs of our community. Online, you'll have the opportunity to fill out the evaluation um, through a, a short online questionnaire at the conclusion of the webinar. And I would uh, please ask you to stick around long enough to uh, answer those questions so we can get some feedback. For those of you on Twitter, uh, we have an active conversation using the hashtag uh, ArcusWebinar to discuss the event. We're currently joined by more than 160 registered participants from throughout the U.S in at least 15 states, and in Canada, the Netherlands, and the UK as well. For those of you on the webinar, my colleagues are available to answer any questions that you have about ARCUS or Arctic research and to forward to us here in DC any questions you have for Courtney or Laura. You'll have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing your questions into the questions pane of the attendee control panel. And uh, you may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Uh, we'll collect them and address them during the Q&A session at the end. Whether you're here or online, I invite everyone to become a member of ARCUS. Uh, currently, all types of organizations are eligible to become ARCUS members, including academic institutions, government agencies, corporations, and indigenous organizations. Also, any individual who shares our enthusiasm about the importance of Arctic research can become an Arctic ARCUS member. I invite you to join us at www.arcus.org, or I can take a member application here if you're in the room. I'd like to uh, acknowledge our uh, partners in this seminar series, the uh, Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which enables us to use this excellent meeting space. And of course, I want to thank the National Science Foundation's Division of Polar Programs for major financial support to Arcus and for the seminar series. Now, let me introduce our speakers. I'll briefly summarize their many accomplishments uh, but the full bios are online. Dr. Courtney Carruthers is an environmental anthropologist researching fishery systems, privatization, and the overall changes facing Arctic indigenous communities. Her work explores human environment relationships, cultural values, equity, and well-being. She currently serves on our search uh, study of environmental Arctic change steering committee, which ARCUS supports as the project office in which she's been an active member. And that's why I got a chance to meet her and her, learn about her interesting work. Courtney is an associate professor of the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Laura uh, Zanotti is an environmental anthropologist and interdisciplinary social scientist whose research program partners with communities to better understand how local livelihoods and well-being can be sustained for future generations. She's an associate professor at Purdue University and holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Washington. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming to the Arcus DC Arctic Research Seminar Series, Courtney Carruthers and Laura Zanotti, whose title is, In a Climate of Change, Co-Producing Knowledge and Community Researcher Relationships 
in the Leadership and Strength Project, Nukiogvik, Alaska. Thank you very much, Bob, for the introduction and to Arcus for your invitation to speak today. We're honored to be here representing our larger leadership and strength project team, including myself, Laura Zanotti, Courtney Carruthers, our master's graduate, Charlene Apak and Sarah Huang, former Upiagvik based research assistant, Charlotte Ambrosek, and our community advisors to the project and all of our participants and partner organizations, especially the native village of Barrow. Following the stated preferences of our project advisors, we are not naming them here, but very much want to acknowledge their ongoing guidance and leadership within this work. We're going to draw upon our project and literature to talk more generally about co-producing knowledge in the Arctic today. We wanted to first begin our project with our origin story, and our story really begins with salmon and climate change. Salmon are a lifeblood to many cultures, communities, and people in Alaska. It's a cultural keystone species, an icon, a huge source of pride that adorns everything from our clothes to our airplanes. When fishery scientists first approached me as a first-year faculty member at UAF in 2008 uh, to see if I wanted to join a project looking at salmon and Arctic uh, climate change, I thought, what a, what a great opportunity to work with local fishermen who know firsthand about these changes. Given how little is known in the scientific literature about this topic, I thought what a great chance to demonstrate to my colleagues the great value of local expertise. In this project, we certainly learned a lot about salmon, um, but one of the most important things we learned in this work was about researcher leg legacies in the community of Ukiagvik Barrow and the way in which non-local scientists often don't serve the community priority or needs. We experienced this in our work firsthand. As non-local researchers, we approached the community with funding already in hand super excited to study the species that we assumed would be of great interest to local people. However, for most people in Utkiagvik, salmon are a low cultural value species. I remember very vividly when we first were introducing this project to the Inupiat community of the Arctic Slope, um, local leaders asking, we think of salmon as wolves of the ocean who eat all of our anaklik, the broad whitefish that we really care about. Why are you here studying this? And it was a big wake up call for us that we had a lot, of, a lot to learn and a lot of work to do. In this process, we also saw how emotional research was for local people. One potent story that stays with me is, is one of our participants who became very agitated during an interview, was sweating, um, sort of going like this, and he, he, he said that our questions about fish and subsistence caused eruptions inside of him. This was the word he used. He pointed out that our study about salmon, climate change, and subsistence fishing maybe seemed very benign to us. The questions we were asking seemed benign, benign but for him and, and likely many others, it, these questions brought up larger issues about colonialism and assimilation, oil and gas development, social, community, family, personal impacts that have really generated, been generated and reverberated over the past decades um, where people have been interacting with companies, universities, agencies, all with non-local desires for, for being in the community. What's more, we were asked really direct questions in this work that really ignited a self-reflexive process that continues to this day one of the questions we, we got, um, you know, you're furthering your career and your students are getting their master's degrees and their PhD uh, degrees from this work. What are we getting? And that's really, I think, what brought us to this, 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 this process. Um, these questions and reflections brought us to what became a nine-year process of working with local leaders in Ukiagvik to develop a collaborative project to understand if and how we as non-Indigenous and non-local researchers could contribute meaningfully to research in Utkiagvik. And importantly, what were the local priorities for research? What stories did community members want to tell? And what was their appropriate and ethical way for us as non-Indigenous and non-locals to contribute? It was in this context that our project that we're going to talk about today, the Leadership and Strength Project, began in 2009 with a different research design rooted in community-based participatory work. As the conversation unfolded, leaders we spoke with during early visits commented that these long-standing and rich histories of men's and women's roles in contributing to community life were recognized locally, but felt that these roles needed more attention and amplification outside of the local region for better representation of community life in non-local contexts. We subsequently co-generated a project whose focus, scale, and scope were tailored to these community interests and highlighting stories of leadership and strength across generations. We, the project team informed by local advisors, developed a set of guiding questions, including 
How do recent shifts in local livelihoods shape what it means to be a leader? How do women's and men's leadership and strength contribute to well-being? And how do women and men nurture diversity and create opportunities for self-organization and self-determination? We're excited to be here today, especially talking to the Arctic Arcus community and talking about what the community can learn from experiences like ours. So we open this talk with our origin story because we believe seated within it are important and critical insights about how and in what way research can and should unfold in the forthcoming decades. Policy and scientific communities recently have called for an up-to-date state of and assessment of the quote-unquote new Arctic because of identified rapidly unfolding unprecedented socio-political, ecological, and economic change. We make the argument that the future of research should also be a decolonial future, one in which researcher communities can build responsive and respectful work with, by, and for indigenous peoples, tribal nations, rights holders, and multi-stakeholder communities to address possible futures that support the well-being and self-determination of Alaska Native and Arctic peoples and the sustenance of their governance strategies and knowledge systems. We're excited to be here and talk about these topics today, especially because Arcus and the community have, has gathered for this talk and webinar embraces similar values of creating spaces to share knowledge, as they note on their website, address transparency, forge multi-knowledge and cross-disciplinary collaboration, make informed decision-making, and support engagement. And we note a growing body of indigenous and non-indigenous scholars, researchers, practitioners, and knowledge holders directly taking up these questions and providing key guidance, guidance and Arcus's sharing of many excellent resources, for example, the one shown here. So what we're hoping to cover, and again, sort of ignite a conversation that we hope will extend you know, far beyond the talk, um, are a few questions, some guiding questions for us today. What is community-based and decolonial research, and why should researchers care about these approaches? What's already been done to develop uh, researcher best practices and ethics that support decolonial research processes and approaches? And how do we work toward those changes? In exploring these questions, we draw from our work, again, as non-Indigenous scholars standing as allied others working with and for Indigenous peoples. We will be drawing from experiences from our collaborative projects, um, but, and we've been incredibly honored to work really closely with communities and with our Indigenous partners but we do want to make very clear that we're not here speaking on behalf of those partners, and nor are we necessarily representing their views. So I'd like to pick up the first question. What is community-based in decolonial research, and why researchers should care about these approaches? So we see this in multiple ways. There's been several trends that have unfolded over the past three decades that respond to strong calls from local communities and indigenous scholars to address negative research legacies, such as the work of Munda Tuhuai Smith, Elizabeth Kovac, and others. Secondly, there's been international standards set by, for example, the United Nations in the landmark 2007 United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And three, there's a scholarly commitment to addressing equity and power not only within the substantive aspects of the research design, but also the methodological portions, as well as the community-based participatory portions. Here, we see that community-based participatory research and decolonial research have started to become more prominent in science-based practice. So next, we'd like to address what is community-based research. Community-based research paradigms have grown in the past several decades, as I just mentioned. Um, especially in within our own fields, conservation-based and sustainability of science, to address the failures predominantly of top-down, expert-driven models of research practice, which considered local communities objects of research rather than equal partners in the research process. CBR is one of very many responses to this, and it is a, quote, process by which decision-making power and ownership is shared between the researcher and the community involved. What is decolonial research? There's also many definitions of this, but here we like to draw attention to Lightfoot, who defines indigenous methodologies as those which, quote, privilege indigenous voices, experiences, knowledge, reflections, and analyses. And indigenous and decolonizing methodologies, equity, power, and rights are directly addressed, and the control of research goals, methods, and outputs are shared with tribes 
project participants, communities, institutions of higher education, or local entities. These paradigms encompass multiple ways of knowing and places value on indigenous forms and processes of knowledge, science, and practice. One might assume that good collaborative research is by its nature decolonizing if it gives community equal decision-making and power-sharing roles as researchers in the research design. Yet a key difference is that decol decolonial research not only seeks transformative change within the research process, but also endeavors to change institutional practices to expand our understanding of working within different types of science and to address questions of equity and justice, especially as they relate to broader goals of sovereignty and self-determination. Finally, as Lightfoot also reminds us, decolonizing research is guided by three principles, reciprocal and respectful relationships, trustworthiness and integrity, and accountability to indigenous communities. Central to this work is respecting and valuing indigenous knowledges and engaging with local worldviews and philosophies as critical components to research design and practice. Importantly, as we've stated before, this research places emphasis on working with, for, and on behalf of tribal nations and indigenous peoples. And here we see a really exciting moment to develop a convergence of decolonial and indigenous research paradigms with other trends that we've seen, again, over the past several decades within the social sciences, environmental social sciences, and sciences in general. And today we wanted to highlight three features of these trends and talk about how we see them intersecting and converging in interesting ways. The first is deepening transdisciplinary research practice through expanding the representation of different ways of knowing and science practices in this way, going beyond dominant interdisciplinary paradigms or transdisciplinary paradigms to involve dynamic heterogeneous knowledges and project conception, framing, and dissemination, enhancing collaborative and participatory work through providing guidelines on relationship building and shared responsibilities, and three, integrating questions of power, equity, and justice, and methodological, substantive, and practice-based components of the research rather than just add-ons at the end. And we're really lucky in Alaska, we have some amazing material to draw from. There's um, some really um, excellent indigenous-led efforts underway right now in, in Alaska and the Arctic and beyond to, to decolonize science research and, and worldviews. And we'd like to recognize a, a few of those important uh, works. First, the Alaskan Inuit Food Security um, Report. For those of you that haven't seen it, it's a, a wonderful resource to, available from the um, ICC, Inuit Circumpolar Council's Alaska's website. It's based on the contributions of 146 Inuit authors, um, Anupiak, St. Lawrence, Yupik, Yupik, and Chupik peoples contributing as authors, and many more from across the North Slope, Northwest Arctic, Borough, Bering Straits, and Yukon Kuskokwim regions. The report conceptualizes food security from Inuit perspectives. The report identifies many things, but a couple to note here that the lack of decision making authority is really a key barrier to food security and a, a reason for food insecurity in our in our communities today. And that strengthening co-management is essential for the, the, the move toward food security and sovereignty. Next I want to mention, we want like to mention the collaboratively harnessing indigenous research principles, protocols, and practices, CHIRP 3. This is a collaborative effort led by First Alaskans Institute's Alaska Native Policy Center and the University of Kansas's Center for Indigenous Research, Science, and Technology. This project develop, is developing new guidelines for building collaborations between Native and non-Native researchers working with Native communities. The, project's, uh, the project team's report is expected to be released in the final form in the next few months and will be available through First Alaskans' website. We greatly appreciate the leads of this project welcoming, welcoming us to share um, in advance um, a few of the points that they mentioned in this forthcoming report. One, that, again from the report, research processes and other systems continue to marginalize and er erase indigenous peoples and their knowledge systems. Research processes and other systems are part of ongoing colonial processes which continue cycles of violence against indigenous peoples. Legacies of research in and on communities as well as current practice has often resulted in bad research experiences. Research, governance, and institutional processes should prioritize embracing, quote, embracing and celebrating indigenous knowledge systems through decolonization. And lastly, decolonization, quote, benefits uh, not only the tribal community itself, but the world. 
And third, we'd like to highlight the work of um, produced by Coeric and Sandhill Culture Craft. They recently re released a report that's available on Coeric Social Science uh, website entitled Research Processes in Indigenous Communities in Western Alaska. This was authored by Brendan and, Jay uh, Brendan and Julie Raymond Yacobian based on a workshop that was held in Nome in uh, August 2016 with key indigenous leaders from Western and Northern Alaska. And similar themes were generated um, in, this, in this workshop and in, in, in the report just highlighting a couple um, research is enacted within inequitable power relationships. Western discourses and institutional practices still determine and structure research paradigms and processes and are connected to colonial histories which still extend to the present. Alaska Native peoples' knowledges are marginalized and ignored in research, educational institutions, and governance practices. Research will not change and possibly, uh, if research doesn't change, um, the situation may, may possibly get worse will possibly go worse. Um, we wanted to note too that NSF was a major funder of the last two efforts that we that we mentioned and I think gives a further indication of the emerging and ongoing support for indigenous approaches to scientific practice. As these efforts make clear there are ongoing work, there is ongoing work to decolonize the research process. We see the Arctic sciences as an important space to do so. If we're committed to equity as a key element of sustainable futures, so the typical three pillars of sustainability, ecological, equitable, rights-based approaches to a changing climate, for example, how rights were acknowledged in the preamble of the now seminal Paris Agreement, and new conservation paradigms that privilege local knowledge systems and inclusive conservation, the decolonization process is a movement that can be embraced by all researcher communities, not just those in the social sciences or humanities, and not just those with activist research agendas. So now we'd like to shift a little bit and talk more specifically about the Leadership and Strength Project. This co-crafted project set out to examine community strength and well-being and further focus on the pathways that women, men, and families forge to live well. We drew upon an engaged research approach through, one, attending to the research process, especially the way in which it was embedded in research legacies in the region, two, creating a diverse research team, engaging with project advisors and local research participants to guide, inform, and co-design the work, Three, spending time in the community and participating in community life. Four, critically evaluating the theoretical and methodological foundations of the work. Five, addressing institutional constraints. And also recruiting and training graduate students with different identities and backgrounds than our own who would bring diversity to the academic arm of the team. Using local language when possible. And through this process, we learned a lot, but we know we still have a lot more to learn. In the next couple slides, we'll talk about some of the different things we did to actually enact this in process. Uh, throughout our work, we were especially interested in integrating analyses of power to better approach how more recent and ongoing processes of colonialism support or challenge community strength, leadership, and well-being. In our project, we learned about historical legacies in the community of Utqiagvik that were sources of trauma, such as the boarding school experiences, prohibition of spiritually central singing, dancing, and drumming, the restriction or prohibition of subsistence activities, and featured here is a, a photo from the Duck Inn in Barrow in 1961. Um, similar um, social movements uh, arose in the community when the, when the whaling was restricted in the 70s. Uh, the Western property notions of land and, and resources being, being privatized, medical testing without consent, oil and gas development and extraction, and general regulatory and bureaucratic governance um, of their lands and peoples that have tra challenged tribal sovereignty and local communities and institutions. These historical and ongoing challenges are disruptive to many communi community members, and research was and is part of this extractive landscape of trauma. So we were not only aware and became aware of the historical legacies of researcher community relationships, but we were also informed of and learned about some great work that's been happening over time and more recently to generate and forge positive researcher community relationships. And here we just like to highlight the North Slope Science Initiative, amongst many others that sought to break down and, and continue to seek to break down the barriers between researchers and community members, and in fact, draw attention to this false binary in the first place. 
And we were told by community members from the very beginning of our project that we needed to make sure that we were committed to conducting research in the area and to be clear about who we were beyond our academic titles, what our funding sources were, and to prioritize community relevant outputs and communication in addition to standard academic reports and publications. And shown here is just one page from um, a report that we put together that we sent out every couple months about ongoing activities in the region to, uh, of our activities um, in order to inform our local collaborators, project advisors, and other entities about our activities to invite feedback and get um, comments. For example, part of our transdisciplinary work uh, really was to engage with various institutions and, and entities in Utqiagvik. The native village of Barrow formally endorsed our project early on and became a key partner throughout our work, and we really thank them for their support. The North Slope Borough Department of Wildlife Management has long been a model of native and non-native researchers and experts working together to implement and perform wildlife and natural resource management initiatives and research on the North Slope. We were super fortunate in our early salmon work to build some partnerships with, with their department and, and um, are so fortunate to continue to be invited to engage with, with their staff and experts in various capacities um, when, in our time in Utqiagvik and, and outside. We also want to mention the Inupiat Language and Heritage uh, Commission, IHLC. They've long supervised and supported humanistic and social science projects focused on cultural heritage and other efforts. And we've engaged with them throughout our work and really appreciate their guidance and helping to shape, shape this work moving forward. We worked with many other partners in the community um, and really support and, and, and recognize all of those entities, but wanted to just highlight a few here. As conversations Oops, sorry. As conversations ensued in terms of determining community relevant outputs, um, many we talked with talked about how we needed to, as I mentioned before, create outputs that weren't necessarily just research reports, although they were interested in seeing those as well. But importantly, those types of um, resources that would engage youth or different generations in different ways was something that was highlighted. For example, one participant shared, quote, the youth are the most important asset a family has. If they're not trained properly, they will not succeed in the Nupiak way of life. You know, they may not succeed that way, but they su can succeed in another way, end quote. So here we were urged to consider different types of platforms for our work and were directed to recent efforts from the community that, was, that were already underway, some of which are shown here, such as the Never Alone Game, the efforts of the Nupiak Studies Learning Program, different documentary films, language nests, and other efforts that they thought might inspire us to consider and in what way we might formulate different products that were not necessarily ac academic based. And after many lengthy conversations and a process by which we designed, it, designed a flexible co-directed research proposal, we were given the approval from the National Science Foundation to adopt this type of methodology to accommodate multiple approaches and various community goals, which enabled us to work on a variety of outputs that we'll talk about a little bit later. And ultimately, we relied on being there, critical case studies, and interviews with working with and for the community. We talked with knowledgeable women and men from different generations to explore leadership and strength and healing and change. And just to give you one example of how our project advisors guided our work. We initially had a 22 question interview that covered different topics, including everyday practices, work histories, subsistence engagement, and attitudes about challenges, changes, and benefits to the community. From the feedback though from our advisors, we shifted our focus to rely more on Inupiaq values and the Inupiaq learning framework. We reduced these questions to 10 with more of a focus on leadership, strength, and healing. For example, we fine-tuned our challenges and changes questions to, act, to ask about what makes the interviewee proud about the community and to name five things that are important to community life. With the guidance, we completed 32 interviews. We conducted a multiple stage follow-up process with participants so they had an opportunity to review, edit, and finalize their transcripts, and this is ongoing. So to prepare those that agreed to it, to have their transcripts and audio archived at the Inupiaq Heritage Center for submission. 
Simultaneously, we sought to identify previous stories of leadership and strength and locally relevant media outputs. So which is shown here, we worked with Tuzzy Library to access the Arctic Sounder archives to identify these stories from print and digital copies of the local newspaper to archive then at Tuzzy. So those that are interested in identifying these stories can have access to them as well. And we wanted to note some of the challenges that we faced. One of them, as we noted early on, we had not anticipated the emotional and difficult nature of conversations around strength and healing that might occur. This prompted us to educate ourselves and our research team and how best to support participants during these hard moments, how to give participants space to pause or stop the interview, and how to address these emotional facets of interviews long after it had ended. It also drove home the important point, again, that we started with of the emotional legacies of research with communities and considering how these, this ongoing work can also have an impact today. And finally, as research unfolded, we finalized our community project outputs as a website with highlights of stories and results from the work and links to f further research. A final project report written for the community posted on the website archives of interviews to be hosted at the Nupiaq Heritage Center, and as I mentioned, a database of leadership and strength stories from the Arctic Sounder. In this way, we hope that the results of the work would re reach a wide variety of audiences and generations, that the process of research would invite collaboration at all phases of the project, and that the decision to include critical participatory principles would enable our team to theoretically and methodologically ask questions about building transdisciplinary partnerships and the associated co-production of knowledge, relationship building within decolonial de research contexts, and questions about power within the research team. We're working on two manuscripts for the scientific literature, but these were of secondary value to the community and thus not prioritized, so are still ongoing. You can find our website at leadershipandstrength.com, and I might add that we had ongoing conversations with the web developer about how to make this website not image or, or um, too heavy to load in order to try to make it accessible as possible with limited potential bandwidth that might be present in different communities. So shifting into sort of our last main set of reflections for the rest of the talk, um, we debated the best way to share the reflections from our experiences and how they might be transferable and relevant to the wider Arctic research community. We ultimately decided to draw some bright lines around some important categories that we think are relevant and applicable for all science and research. These are different pieces to consider in order to work toward co-production and decolonization. In doing so, the next few slides will highlight some key quotes from community members as part of our project um, to show how these recommendations were inspired by and informed by our ongoing work in Utqiagvik. The first, background information and literature review. We invite researchers to consider, as we noted, the researcher legacies within particular communities as critical background information that informs current research practice. Just as with any proposal that examines the literature and context in which research is being conducted to make sure the work is relevant, valid, credible, and up to date, researchers who work with indigenous peoples and on indigenous lands or sovereign tribal nations should be aware of the history of the community, the different types of research communities that work with and have worked with the tribe, the impact of these legacies and current practices, and the ways in which researchers can address past negative experiences and adjust their design to conform to local desires, norms, and mandated ethical practice. So the second um, point to highlight here, team-based and multi-stakeholder, right-holder science. Much research in many fields has shown that diversity in teams and thought enhances innovation. The problem is not the generation of new knowledge in science, but understanding how to work within and across different knowledge sources in a respectful and effective way. Heterogeneity of knowledge practices are the new norm for team-based science, and Arctic researchers have an opportunity to do so in a landscape where they are working with indigenous scientists, indigenous experts living their traditional hunting and fishing ways of life, or as sovereign members of their tribal communities. We have a way to go toward forging best practices. 
Directed to do so by our advisors and participants, we developed a short animated film with the help of Kindia Labs that introduces non-local scientists to some considerations for research in the North Slope region, and it's available on this Vimeo link and also through our website. This is a really small step, but an important one that we were told would help just the, the basic information passing on to new researchers and non-local researchers. Some of the work featured earlier by ICC, First Alaskans, and Coeric are moving us much closer to understanding expectations and responsibilities for ethical res research with indigenous communities. Third, intellectual merit. Many funding agencies are keen to identify ways in which research proposals will advance knowledge and innovate. This is an important moment where, meaningful, where meaningfully engaging with indigenous worldviews and epistemologies can transform and create new paradigms, frameworks, and theories. For example, in the Leadership and Strength Project, resilience and sustainability, two dominant paradigms in our fields, conservation and climate change, were discussed as inadequate frameworks for doing this work. As noted before, this project so sought to better understand leadership and strength through the lens of well-being. Project participants question dominant understandings of resilience and sustainability and encouraged us to engage more explicitly with local worldviews and indigenous scholars, including those within the community, such as the work of Hachark and Ruxford. Community members also directed us to rethink these frameworks and consider their normative and moral dimensions would did not adequately recognize the historical context, best embody in Nupiat values, or promote equitable outcomes. And here you see images of Inupiaq values as well as the Inupiaq learning framework, which we drew upon upon the request of our project participants and advisors as considering a new framework to think about resilience and sustainability. Toward the end of this work, even one of our major guiding lenses in our work uh, around gender became questioned as one Inupiaq leader shared that in an Inupiaq worldview and language with no gender pronouns, this frame may not be the most appropriate. She suggested that researchers at the very outset of a research question or project be very careful not to offer framing ideas or concepts, but rather discuss with local leaders the best way to approach questions of interest and local people can supply the particular cultural frameworks that best work for those questions. Um, cultural continuity, honoring different generations, and supporting family and community were stressed by research participants in our, our work as the preferred pathway to self-determine and just futures instead of sustainable or resilient uh, ones. Broader impacts, where oftentimes broader impact details how research will be relevant for the public good or global humanity at large, we encourage researchers to rethink scale and their broad impacts that these should be locally relevant first. For example, in our case, just one small thing that we did is that we shared insights and scholarship from community members in different policy and academic spaces. We invited community members to participate in relevant workshops, for an example, an environmental justice and research co-management workshop held at our local institutions and the 2016 World Conservation Congress in order to help break down community institutional barriers as well as provide spaces for community members to discuss their rights-based concerns. While in some cases our partners were not able to attend these events, we were able to support and host others at least two of these. Next, data management, access, and sharing. With the increased availability of data, digitalization, archiving, and sharing, new ways of managing and disseminating data abound. Researchers need to consider not only other research and policy communities, but also how and in what ways and in what form this information can be accessed by local community members and rights holders. Important questions around who has rights to information at storage and use in the future are critical and key. Again, to, to cite the CHIRP report that's forthcoming, um, all data collected belongs to the community and should be repatriated to it. Institutions are com compartmentalized. Indigenous knowledges are not. In the words of Barker, they are already and always have been interdisciplinary. So working with indigenous people and indigenous knowledges further enhances innovations in research and practice through demonstrating new pathways for understanding changing landscapes and context. And here we see this convergence with this call for interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary work, and the call for new knowledges to be built. And we see it as a great site and space to engage in decolonial work. 
incommensurable categories when data is a way of life. This quote here, um, it really highlights many key points. Um, it's talking about this word subsistence and how it's really an inadequate word to represent what it means. Um, so, so this dissatisfaction with the word subsistence to capture the essence of a way of life and deep kin and spiritual connections generates a lot of questions for us. What assumptions do we bring as social scientists, natural scientists, humanists, when what is data for, for, our, for the researcher and trying to be very sensitive and open to local preferences for what medium and what measures are the most appropriate ways to convey information? In our work in kind of partnering with natural scientists, we see a real push toward quantification and simple indicators as measures. And that really is uncomfortable for, for us <laughs> and certainly for community uh, members who see so much more context. We again are directed to constantly think about dimensions of power and trauma and justice in our work and all of our kinds of data and representation. All research is, is sensitive research. Again, drawing upon the CHIRP report, quote, indigenous and Western sciences have divergent definitions of data as well as distinct approaches to data collection and analysis, disseminating findings and data-driven action and policy design. Too often, Western definition of these elements are treated as the norm, even though they are not the norm for indigenous peoples, except to the extent that we have been assimilated, and in most cases forcibly assimilated into Western societies by colonial systems. Trust, not just human or social capital. For many indigenous peoples, engaging in a research program is not a bureaucratic partnership, but building a relationship. And for many, a lifelong commitment. Are you ready for this? If you're not, stop. Building local capacity. So you'll see much in the resilient science literature around building local capacity and diversifying institutional capacity enhance, as a way to enhance the resilience of a system in times of change. Often this theory is only applied to local communities with whom scientists work. We suggest a reframing here and that this finding really needs to be applied to researcher and scientific communities. We must build institutional capacity to respectfully and meaningfully engage with indigenous knowledge holders, scientists, practitioners, and sovereign rights holders. This means that researchers should silt, seek to build their local institutional capacity through one, incorporating local community members as key researchers in the research team from idea development, providing spaces for knowledge exchange in local and researcher spaces, increasing the inclusion of indigenous faculty and students in our institutions, curriculum that makes central learning about indigenous peoples and their knowledges and the hist historical and contemporary colonial processes as part of its cu curriculum, and so, so much more. We hope today by outlining and going over some of the more process-oriented facets of our work, we showed how decolonial research is not just new ethics, but a process-based change that's critical to build respectful transdisciplinary practice, enhance collaborative and participatory work by honoring equity and integrating questions of power, rights, and justice in the methodological, substantive, and practice components of the work. In other words, decolonial research is for everyone. There's a lot of open-ended questions that we have. Still, what is the role of indigenous and non-indigenous researchers? And we think as non-indigenous researchers, our first step is recognizing the inequitable relationships that we're involved with, our privilege, and how we engage in partnerships and working in whatever ways makes sense to drive toward equitable futures, but to not determine, to not prescribe vision, goal, or direct, but to listen and hear what's said and contribute as appropriate. And in closing, we wanted to share some stories of hope. One of the bigger take-home messages from our work in Utkiagvik and our other projects, um, local leaders directed us to collect and highlight with external audiences some of the positive stories of leadership and strength and the way in which men and women, elders and youth are actively making their communities well. And those stories contained really difficult and painful details that people have endured and survived on these paths to leadership and strength and well-being. But that's not the focus. That's not what they wanted us to focus on. They wanted to focus on well-being. They wanted to focus on these stories that give strength and empowerment, cultivating this moving forward. And we're not, again, kind of shifting this paradigm of resilience to, to really not be working for resilience, but for just and equitable futures and the processes of healing that we all need to be engaging in. We were incredibly inspired by the relationships we were able to forge as part of this work, and, and really these are lifelong relationships. It was an honor um, to, men to, to mentor um, 
our graduate students in this work. And I wanted to mention Charlene Apuk, and the Inupiaq member of our team, who is now a researcher and clinical research navigator at the South Central Foundation, where she's working with PIs to better craft culturally appropriate protocols in their health-based research. Um, our non-Inupiaq team members continue to contribute to decolonizing work in, in their realms, uh, including food security in Alaska and other parts of the world. So we're hoping this what we've shared today might catalyze um, some conversations and some real partnerships moving forward. Let's work together across generations, across cultures, across disciplines, and vision and mentor and craft new research and new institutional norms. We end with acknowledging that indigenous values, cosmologies, and frameworks are critical to the future of science, especially conservation, natural resource management, and climate change, and provide pillars from which to craft research or community relationships that have specific policy outcomes that support the pursuit of sovereignty and self-determination. Oral storytelling traditions, the valuing of hybrid and plural knowledge systems that combine scientific and indigenous knowledges, the acknowledgement of the deep colonization that still takes place, and the emphasis on crafting projects with, by, and for indigenous peoples are central to this work. So as we conclude, we'd like to acknowledge our funders for this work, the NSF Office of Polar Programs, as well as the College of Liberal Arts at Purdue University. We'd also like to thank very much again our project advisors, research participants in the community of Uptiagvik and the native village of Barrow, Alexava College, IHC, ICAS, UIC, UMIAC, BAS, and all of the other organizations and institutions who have opened their homes and lands to us in different ways and in different forms over the years. We'd also like to flash this slide up. Um, the slides will be archived online, so we wanted to just direct you to it if you're interested in any of the literature that we've consulted um, while doing this talk. Um, but know that you probably can't read this or absorb this at this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much for that inspiring and groundbreaking research presentation. I, I, I think I can speak for everyone to say that this is really amazing and important work, and we're really glad that you were able to share it with us today. Um, we are able to take questions from online. Please type your questions in the chat box. Uh, um, also in the room, um, who has questions? Yeah, Roberto. Hi, thank you very much. This is Roberto Logato from the National Institutes of Health. Um, more of a comment than, than, than question, really. Very proud and excited to, to hear about this work that you're doing with communities in, in Alaska. Um, I also wanted to just inform the audience here in the room and those online that the federal government is engaged currently in several ongoing activities very, very pertinent to, to these activities. One is through the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, which is currently undergoing a review and revision of the IARPIC principles for the conduct mm -hmm. of research in the Arctic. Um, I'm co-chairing uh, a small interagency working group alongside Renee Crane from the National Science Foundation, and we are using multi-pronged approaches, including convening listening sessions at research conferences related to Alaska Natives and, and Arctic communities. Um, we, there's a federal register notice that was published two weeks ago and has an open uh, period for public comment until January 16th, 2018. Um, and we're also targeting uh, individual stakeholders, researchers, and indigenous scholars, and other, other relevant individuals uh, for short interviews to tell us about their experiences and ways to both improve and strengthen those principles. Um, so that is an ongoing activity. I hope that we'll be able to engage with you, your team, and your communities to, to assist us in this process. The other activity that um, I'd like to inform the audience about is from the NIH Tribal Health Research Office. Um, this is a relatively new office which is geared towards uh, a number of activities that include a portfolio analysis, a new strategic plan for tribal health research, but also very importantly and related to today's topic is development of a white paper on, they're calling it points to consider uh, for American Indian Alaska Native health research in the health sciences. Um, unofficially, it's a best practices. Uh, and in fact, the, the co-authors leading this, this white paper are indigenous scholars, including some of you may recognize Denise Dillard from South Central Foundation, another uh, well-regarded indigenous scholar, health scholars like Spiro Manson from the University of, of Colorado, Denver. Um, in any case, um, this is a very, very important uh, activity um, that 
that NIH and the Department of Health and Human Services is, is promoting and supporting. And so I hope that those of you who have interest in the health science research as well will be able to contribute or at least help share uh, information about these, these, these activities. So that's I like. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so other questions in the room? Online. So, can you? Uh, this is a question from Kay Zamzo. It says, uh, can you discuss pros and cons of engaging in indigenous engaging indigenous knowledge in developing environmental impact statements? And is there anyone trying to do this in Alaska? Um, sure, uh, th that's a great question. Um, I think the. I don't know um, in terms of current efforts to, to work on this in Alaska. I'm, I'm drawing a bit of a blank. I, I, um, I think in general trying to understand one of the things that we can share from our work is that often this idea of, of kind of the environment as a separate sphere of, of influence and that the social, you know, human relationship between environments is so close in uh, indigenous and many other communities. So this idea that environmental impacts are also social impacts are also cultural impacts and trying to really broaden the sort of aperture of what kinds of impacts we should be studying and, and asking people about um, with regard to environmental concerns. And I think another thing that, that comes out a lot through our work is the, the long-term cumulative impacts of certain things. So there may be a certain development as planned and there's an environmental in impact statement that's part of that process, but trying to understand sort of cumulative impacts, um, you know, maybe a less studied uh, feature. Laura, did you want to add? And I'll just add one thing, and I'm relying on my memory here, so forgive me if I misspeak, um, but we also learned um, in the community when we were working of the great work of the people of Point Hope um, when Project Chariot was underway and how that work of that community and mobilizing different scientists in the region helped started um, the environmental impact assessment process. Um, and there was some several local filmmakers that made documentaries about this and there's a work um, by O'Neill as well on an oral history of this, I believe. Again, don't quote me on that. Um, but just in terms of identifying how the origins of some of these policies in place initially were derived from the hard work of local communities and the ways in which we can continue to learn from and how to best develop and draw upon that in order to forge future partnerships as we look at what it, what it looks like today, uh, environmental impact assessments. Um, and in part, I'll just add on the end is, is that story also inspired us to start to work with the Arctic Sounder for stories of leadership and strength, although it's different from the Tundra Times that helped um, draw attention to Project Chariot. Um, in the historical moment, we saw these um, spaces as, as really important ways to consider local stories of, of strength and, and healing and leadership. So um, with respect to environmental impact assessments, there's uh, Inutech uh, posts that there was a three-day workshop in Ukiagvik this week, and hopefully a summary will may be made public soon. Um, there's a lot of discussion online about the uh, duck-in. Can you uh, say a little bit more about what that was and what the significance of that was? Sure, sure yes. And I'm, um, again, drawing on my memory. It, to my knowledge, there was um, some regulation around waterfowl hunting um, nationally and probably internationally um, in some regulations put on the communities of the North Slope around, well, not, not hunting in certain seasons. Um, and that wasn't going to work for local people because those were the seasons when the, the, the waterfowl were available for hunting and long, you know, hundreds, thousands of years of, of harvesting in certain seasons. So local people decided they're not going to follow those regulations. And so, um, I, um, again, I'm, I apologize to, to not know the specific names here, but um, local hunters uh, violated the rules as, as a, a public protest, got a lot of people engaged, um, and, and, you know, all got ducks and all sat in a building, and I think there was a federal or state um, official who sort of came and maybe thought, well, I, I should probably do something, and then there were so many people, and, and that person was locked in a building. Does somebody know the, the tale here in the room? But um, it was a, it's a really good demonstration of, of how there can be misunderstandings around subsistence practices, ways of life practice, how regulation can impact those practices, and how local people often need to take it upon themselves to, to, get, um, to, to, to get action. 
And so that was a, there's a great documentary film that's available. We put on the, we have a slide that had the picture from um, uh, the documentary that was made, um, produced by Jana Hartarik um, from Barrow. Yep. Yeah, and the, I think, and Rachel Edwardson as well. So, so there's a great documentary if you'd like the specifics. I'm sorry I didn't do justice to the particulars of that story, but it's a really powerful documentary and would suggest anyone to, that's not familiar with it to check that out. Okay, other questions? Yes. Uh. Ed Washburn from EPA. This is fascinating. Two things and I'm wondering about. One is, have you begun thinking about where is the common baseline for all knowledge? putting on your humility, thinking caps, and saying, well, as a scientist, I think I know what that would be. But then putting that aside and saying, well, there's other forms of knowledge, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, institutional knowledge. You can just keep going. So what is that common baseline, or is there one, or shouldn't we be thinking about that in the co-production of knowledge so all has equal footing, and it's not a decolonization effort, but it's where would that be to start so everybody has an equal footing? And then the second part of that is the computers and cybernetics. That's probably not playing very well up there in remote villages where they don't have signals or they might not have computers. And also the oral storytelling tradition kind of flies in the face of the computerization. And we're finding that people are losing their attention to their local environment by paying more attention to their electronic device than what's in front of them out in the environment. So maybe we need to put more value in that non-cybernetic component. Sure. Yeah, so, so that first question, where's the common baseline for, for all knowledge? Um, certainly, I would imagine we could have long discussions about that, but, but one of the things that we wanted to highlight today, and I'll just reinforce that, is that part of what we've been seeing, again, within the environmental social sciences is this interest over the past several decades is this interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary work. And within the academy, this has asked researchers to get out of their comfort zones and understand maybe common language that we use within and across dif disciplines, but how we use it differently, how we do science differently, think about knowledge production differently, and how to work in diverse teams and work together to um, address um, some of the challenges that the world or our local communities are facing today. And so one of the things that we, we wanted to relate today is we see this, again, as a, as a space in which we can expand that frame outside of the academy, not just thinking about local organizations and institutions, but that too, but also thinking about how and in what way these kind of practices that, that we've been directed to think about within the academy or across institutions can also be fertile areas to explore in working with and across different um, knowledge systems, ways of being, and priorities, and doing so on um, within kind of these team-based practices, right, equal footing, where all members of the team have equal decision-making power, that they can come in at the, the moments in which they, they feel appropriate. Oftentimes, this is from the very beginning, to even formulate the question or formulate the space in which um, you're engaging. Um, Roberto just mentioned different ways of engaging. For example, not talks like this, um, not research spaces like this, although these are important spaces to have, but trying to create different ones that might not be the dominant approach and doing so in a way that might then privilege other ways of knowing and being. Um, with computers and cybernetics, that's also a hairy question you see on the one hand that being a space whereas, as you noted, there's these questions and concerns about maybe distraction or overly reliance on internet and new technologies. But on the other hand, we've seen indigenous engagement with media, digitization, um, the internet, and, and ways in which that really expand and advance our understanding of the applicability and use 
um, different ways in which to explore knowledge transition and engagement of youth for, I'll just reference the Never Alone game, the Inupiaq Viva program that was created, and many other ways in which this is a space not for um, demoralization or disempowerment, but a space in which to think about other ways to engage, connect, share, and create and, and forge different new and different types of communities. And so certainly there's that, that, there's that issue of, of security, for example, data security, um, aspects of access, sharing, and use, um, protection, um, as well as potential exposure of, of different and, and other things on the internet, right? There's that dark side of um, engaging in the internet. But, but these are also balanced by these, these other um, really important spaces that um, it's, it's offered in, in many different ways. So it, I, I don't see it as, a, as just a, a negative. So um, I've got a couple more quick questions I wanted to throw in here. I know we're running short on time, but uh, there's just some great dialogue going on here. Um, how do researchers meet with the uh, sometimes political implications of uh, some of the community issues like uh, local activism? Just to comment on that briefly, I think it touches a little bit where my mind went with the last question around knowledge. I think part of what the literature that we've been reviewing in this work and, and our guidance from, from other experts is around really rethinking this idea that, that knowledge is fact-based and depolitical and doesn't have values and, and really interrogating what are the value systems that promote a certain view like that. So, so you know, what do we gain if we think about knowledge as you know, linked to power all the time, or linked to values all the time, or linked to a dominant or non-dominant worldview all the time, right? Can we really separate our knowledge at all? So I think that's a great question, um, and I sort of approach it from the angle of maybe we need to start rethinking our paradigms of what, you know, quote unquote knowledge is, and if it's, if it's linked to, to values and, and power in politics or not. Well, thank you very much, and I'm I'm really I hate to cut the questions off, but I know people have other things, and so um, I just want to thank you guys both very much for the wonderful presentation. So, thank you guys for coming. And so, uh, just as some closing remarks, I want to uh, uh, first of all uh, thank uh, Courtney and Laura for an amazing presentation. I encourage people who want to continue this dialogue to go on Twitter using the uh, hashtag Arcus Webinar. And there is a lot of dialogue going on online. Maybe the people in the room here don't realize how much, but um, the recording is going to be available online, as is the uh, as are the slides. And so please do uh, check that out, and you can see the, all of the uh, dialogue that's going on. First thing I want to say about the upcoming events is that this first date is wrong. It's actually February 12th that uh, Roberto Delgado, who's actually here in the room, and um, Andrea Marquez Horvath are going to be presenting um, in the next webinar in, in February and to, on the 12th. And then on March 17th, uh, Matthew Jewell from the University of Virginia will be presenting. Um, I invite everybody here to come to the Arcus Annual Meeting, which will be taking place in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, on uh, Wednesday, December 13th. And following that meeting, there will be a community-wide reception uh, uh, with uh, drinks and food and lots of good com comradeship. So encourage uh, everybody who's going to be in New Orleans that week to be there. Um, also, we still have spaces available for meetings that people want to hold at the uh, Arcus uh, Community Meeting Room that's going to be taking place in New Orleans. So uh, you can check out that link. Um, and uh, our next big uh, public event beyond uh, the AGU Meeting Week is the uh, Arctic Community Open House, which will be taking place uh, um, at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium on January 23rd. Um, thank you so much for coming out today for this seminar. Thank you to uh, Laura Zanotti and uh, Courtney Carruthers for the presentation and engaging this dialogue. I hope we can all go forward with enthusiasm about collaborative, collective, and mutually beneficial uh, research taking place in uh, Arctic communities. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day.